today we'll be talking about indications for spine ultrasound. We'll become familiar with normal anatomy and review various spine anomalies that can be identified by ultrasound. We'll also talk about the limitations of the exam and the pitfalls that may simulate disease. Ultrasound evaluation of the spine in children is quite helpful because it's inexpensive. There's no need for sedation and allows for a cl clinical determination of abnormalities that may require urgent intervention. MRI is the gold standard of assessing the spine but requires sedation and is quite expensive and may not be available. So we'll talk about indications, the imaging strategy, and talk about normal anatomy and embryology of the spine. We'll then talk about normal variants, what the father cyst is, pseudomass, coccygeal variations, and the pseudosinus tract. Lastly, we'll talk about the actual pathologic entities that we use ultrasound for to look. Why do we look at the spine? Well, we know that there are anomalies that are associated with tethered cord and spine abnormalities. These include imperforated anus. We do know that with sacral dimples that are complicated, either they're above the gluteal crease, there is a very deep pit, there's drainage from the dimple, or there's a soft tissue mass, all of these have a higher incidence of cord anomalies. We can also use spine ultrasound in patients who have a failed lumbar puncture. You can differentiate high risk from low risk lesions. If the mass is hyper hypopigmented, midline, with a deep pit above the intergluteal crease, these are considered high risk. If it's simply a Mongolian spot or a hemangioma or port wine stain off midline, a pit below the intergluteal crease, these are considered low risk. So here are examples of high risk midline lesions, and this is a low risk lesion with a Mongolian spot and skin tag. So MR is the gold standard for spine imaging, but we can look at the spine um, as far as a year or two of age. It becomes very difficult, however, the more the spinous processes ossify. Embryologically, we'll talk a little bit about why different spine abnormalities occur. Initially, you have neuralation. The neural plate begins to develop at the third week gestation, and they thicken and form the neural folds. There's progressive development of the neural plate, groove, and neural tube. Canalization occurs when the distal end of the neural tube fuses with the neural epithelium. It forms an ependymal-lined neural tube which unites with the rest of the spinal cord. The caudal mass distal to the neural tube coalesces and eventually fuses with the neural tube. Embryologically, there's retrogression differentiation which causes caudal cell mass and the caudal neural tube to become smaller. Eventually, the distal conus medullaris forms. There is a focal dilatation of the central spinal canal called the ventriculus terminalis, and we also have the phylum terminale. Now, spinal dysraphism can be separated into open and closed spinal dysraphism. And in the closed spinal dysraphism, you can separate them further between those that have a subcutaneous mass and those that do not. With the open neural tube defects, these are not skin covered. You'll have a meningomyocele or a myelocystocele. With the closed subcutaneous masses, if the mass is present, it can be a lipomeningocele, a meningocele, 
a serval called myelomeningocele or myelocystocele. If there's no mass, it can be a simple lipoma, tight phylum, or it can be caudal regression, a split cord, or a neuroenteric cyst. This is an open neural tube defect where you have a translucent membrane with no skin covering. These typically are separated into myelomeningoceles where the plaque coat is elevated by the expansion of the subarachnoid space, or the myelocele, which is a plaque of neural tissue that lies exposed to the same plane of the skin. Neither of these are skin covered and both are associated with meningomyelocele, um, sorry, both are associated with Chiari malformations. With closed dysraphism, you have a skin-covered mass that may have discoloration or hairy patch associated with it. These can be separated into meningoceles, where again, this is skin-covered, but it's associated typically with a tethered cord, but not associated with a Chiari malformation. You can also have a lipomyelomeningocele, which is also skin covered, typically with a mass not associated with a Chiari malformation. Myelocystoceles is a dilated terminal ventricle that herniates through a spinal defect. These typically herniate in the third trimester and may have some post fo posterior fossa herniation as well. Lipomas, persistent terminal ventricles are also closed spinal dysraphisms that are skin covered. The most common abnormality that we look for by ultrasound, however, is the tethered cord. So how do we start? Will you have the child lying prone? It's useful to have a towel rolled under the belly for better contact with the transducer. And a linear 5 to 12 megahertz transducer should be used. If there's a soft tissue mass, that can be evaluated by ultrasound as well to see whether it's fatty or vascular for hemangioma. If there's no connection of the mass to the spinal canal, the spine itself can then be looked at. One starts with the vertebral body counting, and it's very important to know what level of the conus the um, tip of the conus is. And this can be done by counting from the ribs down or from counting from the coccyx up. If there's confusion about where the actual level of the conus is, there may be some vertebral anomalies, or it may be unclear whether the, um, there are 11 ribs or 12 ribs. One can identify where the conus is lying and put a marker on and get a radiograph to see the level of the conus. So here we have an image of the spine. This is a young infant in which the spinous processes are not ossified, so there is no shadowing. These are the vertebral bodies. This is the conus, the central canal, and here are nerve roots. Notice since this baby is prone that the nerve roots are lying close to the gravity-driven positioning of the nerve roots. And here's an image again of the spinous processes, dura, cord, and caudioquina. In the transverse image, we see the cord, central canal, nerve roots. By real time, these will be pulsating. And here again, we have the transverse process, the cord, the central canal, and the nerve roots. When counting, we start from below. The coccyx tends to be a more circular structure than the sacral elements. Once the coccyx is identified, one can start from S5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and count. Generally, the L5, S1 
level has a mild transition where the Boeing bending is.